So, Acheron's been out for a couple of days now, and those days have given me a lot of time to better figure out and more simply describe her capabilities and how she can easily be built into a team. That's when I realized that there is one thing that people will need to understand about her if they want to pull for her and if they want to build a team around her. This video will talk about her biggest points as a DPS and also the unique problems that she faces considering the types of changes that she is bringing into the considerations people will have when building a team that has to cater to her playstyle. Without further ado, I'm Leafy and this is Casual Guides to Games Star Rail Edition. The number one sentence that I would use to describe Akron's playstyle is restrictive but with high rewards when done right. Especially at E0, she immediately limits your team to always having to consist of 3 nihilities and a sustain. For a lot of people, this can be a massive turnoff, since most would have really loved to use that third nihility slot for someone who can better support her damage capabilities or the team in general. And it's not really an option for you to not have those other two nihilities in the team since it's such a big jump between the buffs of only having one other nihility in the team and with what you would have if you were to have two of them. An additional 45% damage boost to an already decently strong nuke ultimate is a pretty huge upgrade. So only running Akron with one other nihility just leaves too much damage on the table. It doesn't help the fact that her E1 doesn't really do much to alleviate the restrictiveness of this playstyle. Sure, it is essentially a free 18% crit rate boost, but it seems like such a hurdle for people to go through if they want to guarantee that E2. This is why I keep telling people, if there is a choice between going for Acheron's cons and saving up to give you better chances of getting a future character like Aventurine, then I'd first ask if they are confident on whether or not they can get to that E2. If they don't think they can get to E2, then you're better off just pulling E0 and her light cone, and then saving the rest to have a better chance of getting Aventurine. And funnily enough, if Akron herself is restrictive, then her light cone itself is nigh impossible to use on another nihility without losing so much of its inherent value. All of the other nihility characters won't be able to use that crit damage increase, and barely any of them would be able to get any meaningful stat increase from the passive that it gives. So, if you're going for her light cone, just know that she is literally the only character that can use it. Unless you're a psycho and you built crit Kafka, then I have no comments. Just know that I mildly don't have any respect for you. If you think that you won't be able to get her light cone, then Good Night Sleep Well is a decent enough light cone that you can use to substitute in for her signature. But you probably already knew that, so I'm just here to remind you that it's an option. Back to the topic of Eidolons, if you are able to get to her E2, then you would have a much easier time playing her. With the restriction of the three nihilities now lifted from your team comp, you can slap a harmony character alongside her and boost that damage even further. Your typical harmony characters like Ronmei, Ronya, and Sparkle will all do very well alongside her. Personally, I pair her up with Ronmei. It's a much more SP efficient option and her toughness break boost will do well in helping your characters apply debuffs faster through breaking your enemies, making accumulating Akron stacks become much easier. E2 Akron is such an increase in her character value that I would recommend it to anyone who's in need of another easy to use AoE nuke, or just anyone who wants to do some big boy damage in general. It's like that difficulty lever going down as soon as you get to E2. Speaking of her stacks, the energyless gameplay of hers is also a massive game changer when it comes to how people will perceive building her team. There is no need to put a battery in the team for her and you can pretty much use her ult every single battle, regardless of whether or not it's an elite fight, since the stacks don't carry over from one battle to another and that you'll start with pretty much the same amount of stacks every battle anyways. There is an important note that I think most people would have already been familiar with if they have started playing with Acheron, but I'll demonstrate it and repeat it anyways because this is such a big thing to understanding her roundabout playstyle. 
Her stacks are accumulated through every instances of debuff application, not for every debuff applied. So before you go ahead and think that her debuff stacks are very easy to get to, you gotta understand it from this kind of scenario. Let's say we have an Akron team with Black Swan, and you're ready to use Black Swan's skill on your enemies. Here's the thing. If you were to purely look at the debuffs that Black Swan will apply through this attack, then you would think that Akron is about to accumulate so much stacks just from this one skill. Decadence False Twilight, with the proper effect hit rate, applies Arcana to all three enemies hit by it. Moreover, it also has a chance to apply a defense shred alongside those Arcana debuffs. So, in all technicality, you'd be applying a total of 6 different counts of debuff on your enemies. Now, most of you who didn't really look into the specifics of Akron's slashed dream stacks would probably think, well, golly, then that's 6 stacks that Akron is about to get. Well, the answer to that thought is... <laughs> no. Let's face it, if this was truly the case, then they would have to make a separate category for her in the tier list. Simply because she'd probably be able to ult every single turn if that had been how her mechanic works. No, like I said before, the stacks only count every instance. Meaning that the singular usage of Black Swan's skill to apply all those debuffs are counted as one stack of Slash Dream. This particular fact is actually one of the biggest reasons why she had to be a Nihility character. Because if we were to be logical and look at the way her kit works and how her talent and Eidolon buffs are, she is very much the definition of a picture-perfect erudition DPS. AoE attacks? Check. Ultimate buffing talents? Check. Is an absolute god when you use her with the erudition path? Most definitely. Check. Moreover, this wouldn't be the first time we have someone from a path that isn't Nihility that relies on enemies having debuffs to further boost their damage. Our resident nerd, Dr. Ratio, is a character who basically needs constant debuffs on the enemy to make sure that he can achieve his peak damage output. And he's a hunt character. However, with the amount of debuff instances that she'll need to get to her ultimate, it further puts her in a path where there was no other way for her to be a character other than to be a Nihility. As godly as she is to be considered an erudition character, the core mechanics of her playstyle just makes it impossible for her to be considered as anything else. Compared to other erudition such as Himeko and Jingyuan, her damage just isn't going to be there if Akron herself doesn't have the ability to better apply and utilize debuff further solidifying the case for her to remain as a Nihility character. That being said, the final piece of the puzzle to understanding how to play Akron herself is to know that even though her underlying core mechanics are deeply rooted within Nihility, the basics of building Nihility DPSs do not apply to her whatsoever. Her nuke playstyle makes it so that you have to build her using the traditional DPS way of building up those crit stats and attack. Ignoring the normal nihility route of building attack, effect hit rate, and break effect instead. So if you're pulling for her thinking that you're gonna have another Kafka-like character for you to use, then you better think twice about whether or not you actually want to pull for her. Then again. This is why I say that traditional Harmony characters like Bronya and Sparkle will work handily with her because, unlike Kafka, Akron can most definitely make use of the extra attack and crit damage buffs that those two Harmonies will be able to provide for you. But once again, you're gonna need to figure out if you'll be wanting to get to that E2 first before you can even consider the possibility of using a Harmony character in her squad. Because unless you want to risk it all and just go full glass cannon without a sustain to back you up, then chances are you're not going to have the option to even consider using a Harmony character in her team. With all that out of the way, let me just give you a quick summary of what you probably should be prioritizing in terms of what to pull and how you should be managing your jades in the coming banners. Highest priority of her banner is to get E0 and S1. Do this before deciding on anything else. 
If you're confident in getting E2 Akron and her light cone, and you just want to spend all your jades to getting the most out of her, then go for that option. But if you're struggling between going for E1 Akron and saving up for a future character like Aventurine or Robin, then my suggestion is to forget about getting E1 and just save your jades for the future characters. It's much more worth it for you to guarantee getting another character rather than to only go for an Eidolon that doesn't really give you all that much value relative to that of a new character. Basically, go for E2 or don't go for Eidolons at all. Except for all you whales out there, ignore the section and just do whatever you want, buddy. That just about rounds it up for this video. Regardless of what you might think of her kit, I won't deny that she has been incredibly fun for me to play. Pairing her up with the Path of Erudition and this theme of Black Swan, Ron Mei, and Fu Shen has been such a fun way of ripping through Star Rail's content. I've yet to try her out in the latest iteration of Pure Fiction, so that's definitely something that I'm gonna look forward to doing sometime soon. Plus, being able to ult small enemy waves without having to think of the fact that I won't have the energy for it in the next battle is such a cathartic way of blitzing through simulated universe and general farming. If you're able to push yourself past all her restrictions, then you'll have a lot of fun playing and wrecking enemies with her. That being said, thanks for watching the video. Leave a like if you enjoyed it, dislike if you don't, and let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. The name's Leafy and I'll see you in the next video. Sayonara.